Hello and welcome to the law.mit.edu Computational Law Reports Idea Forum on Composable Governance. Today we're going to hear from several invited speakers with some flash talks on the notion of composable governance, what it is and what it could be. Um, here, for your convenience, is our itinerary for this forum. And without further ado, why don't we jump right in with Joseph and Natalie to learn more about Kataba and uh, recent proposed regulation that speaking as, the, as a forum organizer, we hope you'll all take special notice of, and if you're able to, share your own ideas and get back to these folks with answers to their questions. So with that, Joseph, Natalie, please take it away. Hi, everyone. It's, it's an honor to be talking to all y'all. Just like to briefly tell you about the Catawba Digital Economic Zone. So within the United States, uh, state uh, tribes um, by sovereign Indian governments have the same authority, generally speaking, as US states, and sometimes even higher, especially in the realm of economic regulation. So the Catawba uh, Indian Nation on February 19th, they passed a law which created a special jurisdiction within their own reservation, which allows it to have a, its own unique, distinct commercial code and regulatory body. And that regulatory body is capable of registering companies, the same that Delaware Secretary of State is capable of registering companies, and also issuing and promulgating regulations on top of their unique commercial code that uh, regulates the conducts of businesses that are virtually domiciled within the zone, also fairly similar to the Estonian ideal. Uh, and so what we're doing right now is we're issuing the initial regulations um, that put digital assets under existing law, as well as recognizing DAOs as different legal entity types that are recognized all across the United States and the world, like LLCs or unincorporated nonprofit associations. The real key part of, of this in, in the digital asset space and in, in, in the in digital governance space is ultimately governance and sovereignty is tied to land and is tied to sovereigns. So unless you solve for that jurisdictional piece, a lot of the problems won't be solved. But the problem is um, with most governments, especially ones in the United States, uh, especially our federal government, those jurisdictions are unbelievably slow and the education process to get to the point where we can have solid statutes and regulations that meet the needs of frontier technology will take too little, too long. Um, versus Native American tribes, and especially uh, our model, where we have a nimble five-person commission creating regulations, we can move infinitely quicker than even the smallest uh, uh, state bodies. For instance, Wyoming. Wyoming is known for being the digital asset state. Um, and while they have made great strides, Ultimately, they are a body that relies on, on uh, that has 300,000 citizens um, that only needs two months out of the year and has uh, you know, thousands of businesses. Some, some of them have existed for hundreds of years. And as a consequence, there are special interests that don't allow them to move as nimbly. Um, our body is able to move nimbly and focus on you know, what are the best regulations for the industry as a whole and provide better solutions for everyone. And so one of the first things that we're focusing on through our advanced uh, notice of, uh, of regulation is that we're providing a regulation for DAOs to classify them as legal entities within the zone. Um, so we invite all of you to come to our Discord. We're one of the first governments in the world to use Discord for their commenting period, where you can give feedback about, uh, uh, so that was a timer, uh, about you know, upcoming DAO regulation, answer the questions. We'd love if, to co-create with you some of the best DAO regulations and digital governance regulations in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And we really do appreciate that bell going off. And so uh, let this jurisdiction be a model for all of us, not only in their policy making, but also in their timekeeping. Um, and so could you just let everyone know exactly where would people go if they would like to learn more about this and if they'd like to join the conversation and provide answers to the questions that you're showing here in your advanced notice of proposed rulemaking? So Natalie is showing it on the screen and it's zoneauthority.io and then you can look in upcoming regulations and you could have access to our online forum for the, the advanced pro uh, proposal of rulemaking as well as enter our discord. 
Outstanding. That's perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, now, uh, next, uh, Nathan Schneider, uh, you are up, sir. Okay. Um, so um, I'm not a lawyer. I, I uh, you know, come to the the law of uh, to this conversation through the law of code, um, and I really appreciate the chance to to share some of the stuff I've been involved in. Um, you know, a lot of the work in the past few years I've been doing has been framed around a kind of deepening historically grounded sense of how bad uh, online spaces are for kind of the basic practices of democratic governance. Um, so uh, I've made some kind of passing observations about comparisons to uh, uh, basic civic associations like my mother's garden club, um, delved into the historical context into why things like elections and rules that hold power holders accountable are just not present in online spaces. There are also kinds of interesting historical twists and turns that help explain why like some of the things we expect in ordinary civic and political life are just not present in online spaces. And this really matters, particularly um, as these spaces become uh, so important politically and socially, uh, as well as educationally. What are they training us for? What kinds of politics are we learning to practice when we live in online space? Um, so fortunately, as I was developing this, this critique, this, this frustration, um, I came in contact with the Meta Governance Project, then a very nascent um, research collective, um, Zargum, who you'll be hearing from as part of it as well, um, a group of practitioners and researchers uh, who are exploring how to build um, governance layers for the internet. And one of our, our initial um, forays was a paper uh, called Modular Politics, um, a exploration of what a, um, a, a preferable uh, um, approach to uh, governance and online space could look like. And um, here's where we get to the composability stuff. Um, we end up landing on this uh, uh, approach based on modularity, um, where, where different kinds of governance primitives can be um, added and subtracted and connected to each other um, to make governance a creative space uh, akin to you know, a plug-in ecosystem or an app store. Um, they should be modular, expressive, so that you can express a wide variety of governance practices portable, so um, practices developed in one space might move to another easily, and interoperable, so different spaces can talk to each other and interact with each other. Um, we present this as a framework through which we could see uh, a kind of flourishing of creative governance experiments um, in, in a variety of technical contexts. And since developing this paper, we've been exploring a few different implementations. I'm gonna share just a couple of, of, of our experiments. One is the Medigov Gateway, which is built on um, the policy kit software project by uh, uh, developed by Amy Zhang at the University of Washington. Um, it's a API based system that allows you to embed governance actions that are programmable um, in popular social spaces from Slack and Discord and so forth, also to um, uh, uh, spaces that carry financial resources like Open Collective. So you can actually make a decision through emojis in Slack and open up, um, approve a, uh, a financial transaction on Open Collective. Uh, so enabling governability through these kinds of modular um, uh, uh, processes in popular uh, uh, social spaces. Uh, another experiment that I've been leading is called ModPol. It's a plugin uh, written in the language Lua uh, for, um, for online games. Uh, so Lua is a widely used uh, language for online for extending online games. ModPol is a base layer framework to allow you to build modules to create governance in groups um, in, in gameplay. Um, so it was first built for this Minecraft clone called MindTest. We're next going to be developing a web interface. Um, but again, the idea is, can we bring this kind of composable modular um, governance system into, uh, into gameplay? Um, finally, an implementation not um, coming out of the Meta Governance Project per se, but 
people who are kind of friendly is Zodiac, which is a modular expansion pack for um, for DAOs uh, run out of uh, Gnosis, which is a popular multi-signature wallet. Um, so this is just an example of how others are starting to use some of these ideas and um, and make uh, modular governance systems um, into a new normal. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Um, and we'll be sure to share links to those uh, resources um, on the event page when we publish it. So um, speaking of the event page and publishing, next up we have our very own editor-in-chief of the MIT Computational Law Report, the very publication that will be putting out the Composable Law Special Release. So yeah. please take the hot seat. All right. <clears throat> So thanks to everybody for joining. Really excited uh, to have you all here with us and to, to be around so many people who are experimenting with the same notions that we've been thinking about for, uh, for longer in, in many cases, I think, than we have. Um, what we really see as our role in trying to accomplish this is to get people to think about this in a in a critical way, so we're, we're we we want to be a megaphone for everybody who's already out there doing great stuff, um, and to the extent that people are experimenting with this, we want those experiments to be highlighted. We want more people to participate with them, and we want to really get into this, you know, kind of system design notion of like composability as something uh, that deals with the interrelationship of all of these different components, whether it's a component on a blockchain, whether it's a component not on a blockchain, because when you think about, you know, coming up with playbooks or toolkits or guides or, um, you know, wizards to set things up, uh, you know, some of it, it might be the case that some things should be on a blockchain, but I think in a lot of cases there are going to be instances where it would be much preferable to use a, a less sophisticated technology, a less energy consumptive technology, uh, more informal technology. I think uh, the way that techno solutionism has kind of taken hold and taken root in a lot of the uh, areas of our society that have the biggest voices in this space is something that isn't uh, driving the bus in the direction that we would want it to be. And so in order to counterbalance that, in order to kind of provide uh, so some type of sense-making function as well, in addition to the megaphone for the great projects that are out there. Um, we, we really want to do our part to make, the, to make all of this more responsible. And to that end, we, we decided to have this uh, special release or this, uh, what are we calling it? Are we calling it? Yeah, it's a special release on composable governance. And so we're just going to highlight as many papers as we can get to come through that discuss this topic. We're going to highlight as many experiments. We're going to highlight as many uh, as many projects, as many questions, uh, as many videos as we can. And and we're kind of uh, we we started with the idea of doing something on like a timeline, but now I think it's it's evolved to a point where you know this this will probably be something of an ongoing effort. Uh, to continually provide that megaphone and that sense-making ability in the space as it continues to evolve and grow, because I think that's something that's going to be necessary while all these new technologies are coming out and while people are still understanding what's the responsible way to do this, how do we do this without getting people's money, without risking people's livelihood, and without, <clears throat> without uh, uh, degrading our value systems in a way that uh, keeps us from putting the cart before the horse. And so that's kind of my, uh, I don't know, uh, gung ho call to uh, contribute. So I'm, I'm very excited and very grateful for you all and uh, looking forward to looking forward to the rest of the talks here. And with that, I'm giving, I'm ceding my uh, hot seat moment back to <laughs> Thanks very much. Editor in chief right there, Brian Wilson. Um, so let's see. Ah, and we're on a roll with Brian's now. And so uh, next up, uh, Brian Monda, who has just published a very interesting article um, exploring the, the shape and the 
um, I guess, description of, um, of governance and DAOs. And um, so Brian, uh, thank you for joining us today and you've got the floor. Thank you, Daza. Um, so um, essentially, uh, myself and a group of colleagues uh, from Canada and England um, came together to think about the aspects of corporate governance. And we looked at uh, decentralization, decentralized governance as a way of taking us into the next millennium, you know, into the, into the future. And since this is what um, the, the current, uh, this is where it is in the current society, decentralized finance, blockchains, and smart contracts. And looking at it from a position of England and Wales, you have uh, the law commission saying that smart legal contracts uh, can be a recognized form of law. And they're currently doing uh, research on the legal recognition of DAOs in England and Wales as well. So we're looking at, at this in terms of the future of corporate governance. DAOs present themselves as a solution to the um, principal agent problem. And they, they are sort of appealing in that the membership, you can be uh, any, anywhere in the world really. And at the click of a button, you join a DAO. It doesn't have this sort of strenuous interview process or you, you don't have to have multiple qualifications to be part of that. As long as you share the objective and the agenda and you have a forward thinking sort of momentum towards something, you can literally all gather together and get it to happen. However, the law does not address the salient aspects of this in terms of governance and liability. So you have the um, BZX DAO case happening in uh, the US right now, where it's just been filed and we're looking at the uh, liability of members of the DAO, uh, whether they're jointly or sever severally liable. And um, it, it presents interesting questions because people, uh, there's been assumptions uh, in the community that if um, it's not incorporated, then the default is that it's a partnership, but this has not been cited strongly in law. It's still very um, at early stage and people are making assumptions. So is it safe uh, in our study, we are trying to understand whether DAOs can be safe for corporate governance or is it just an illusion when it comes to corporate governance? So our sort of summation, because we are further developing the, our research, we are suggesting that it's not an illusion as much as it's in its infancy, there's still further research to be done. And the more you experiment with it and learn from the mistakes that have happened in the past, for example, looking at the instance of the DAO hack itself or um, the Solana emergency powers that happened, uh, the, the proposal that needed emergency powers that happened sometime on the was it the 19th of June, sometime last week or last week, but one. So we are looking at such elements. So the DAO is supposed to be fully automated, but we are seeing aspects of lots of human inter, in, interaction with the DAOs. So is it safe to say that a fully autonomous DAO is restricted to X sort of work and DAOs that have human participation could be uh, set aside for uh, Y sort of work? And if we look at it together or separately, what does it do for the future of corporate governance? So that's where we are. We are still exploring our research and we are trying to really uh, go into the, you know, the heart of things and develop further on this. Thank you for that. Great. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, and we will link to that paper um, as well. Uh, and look forward to your future your future work. It raises some interesting questions. Um, and so I guess that is me yeah. next. Okay, and so since I'm already talking, uh, hi, I'm <laughs> Tassa Greenwood. Uh, and um, I, you know, what's been said so far has, um, is, uh, has um, raised a lot of interesting, um, you know, kind of thought cascades. So let me just start by, um, by start with a couple of those and then tie it into my general topic, which is situating this um, 
um, idea forum and this special release on composable governance in the MIT computational R report in the broader MIT context. So to start with, um, when, when Brian Mondo was just speaking, uh, part of what I was just thinking was, okay, um, when, when we apply the notion of composable governance in the blockchain and specifically the DAO space, which is I think a lot of people's first assumption of what the context is, um, <clears throat> A, um, as Brian Wilson, I think, took uh, care to point out, we're not speaking exclusively in a DAO or even in a blockchain context necessarily when we ask the question, what is or what could composable governance be? Um, certainly in that context. And, and I think because of all the innovation and the, the rapid pace of innovation in the DAO space, that's where the action is right now. Um, and that's give, given us the opportunity to speak in, in, in fairly creative ways um, about uh, composable governance. But, um, but it's important to say not exclusively there. But starting with that though, you know, D is for decentralized, A is for autonomous, and O is for organization. And when you look at DAOs, I think each one of those words is, can be strained. Um, like they're not necessarily particularly decentralized. In fact, they're not, you know, and that's just, you know, some of that is because it's a journey toward decentralization, fine. Uh, they're not auto autonomous, you know, they're, they're, they're heavily driven by people and then you know, a lot of the actions in discord and, you know, uh, they're not the, the, the dream of like, you know, uh, of um, ultimate autonomous, you know, algorithmically um, self organizing kind of um, things. And, you know, uh, with all due respect, some of them are barely organized. Uh, and so, uh, so, and yet, as I said, and I hasten to add, like, it's really interesting in some of the stuff there, like there's so many diamonds in there. Um, and I, I wanna thank, among other people, Wasim and, and Zargum and others who have taken care to educate me about what's happening at the frontiers of this space. And I've seen some, I've stood on the mountain and I've looked over the horizon and I see that there's some good stuff uh, and it's worth looking at, it's worth talking about, it's worth making, making usable. So, uh, you know, uh, I'll say one quick story uh, and then, uh, are you keeping time? Yes. Am I at time already? We're good. Okay. We're good. Uh, and so one quick story is uh, in 1997, <laughs> <laughs> in the last century, um, when I started at MIT, um, that, that my first project was something <laughs> called um, was something called OpenGov, and uh, it started based on this um, local office that I was elected to, um, something called Town Meeting, New England Town Meeting, and so we've got this holdover from pre-revolutionary days before the U.S. Constitution, where people in a given town uh, would get together. Um, and they would, oh, I think it might be a different one. Uh, anyway, it would get together and they would, um, if you lived in the town and you were an adult, uh, you got one vote. Um, and so uh, it's still, uh, I think you, 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 basically we, we'd get together once a year uh, and we'd sort of set the local town tax policy. We'd figure out how much money is going to police and fire versus schools, which is like half the budget, you know, filling potholes we'd self-govern ourselves at the, at the local level. It was basically a, a, a close to platonic ideal of, of, of democratic governance. Um, people would stand up and they would say real stuff and we all knew each other and, like, and we would fight and we would agree and we would figure stuff out um, and it mattered. Um, and, uh, and so I started in this first project basically seeing if we could translate the fundamentals of how we organized ourselves and came to these decisions um, to do so online, which itself was revolutionary. And this is, you know, pre-Zoom. Um, and so anyway, um, and then what I quickly discovered was that was kind of interesting, but it wasn't interesting enough for MIT, even though it still is an interesting thing. If you look at, you know, parliaments and other things, like we barely can do Robert's rules online. But the, the question that it changed to, which I think is still relevant today was, yeah, sure, you could do something with, you know, like 150 people online, but what can we do with the unique properties of the internet and the, the web, which is burgeoning at that point? Um, 
that that would allow something that we never could have done before. Um, and so the question quickly became and has been ever since, how could we self govern ourselves at the scale of 10,000 people or 10 million people? Could we do that in a span of the same amount of time it would take to go to a New England town meeting of like several hours or a couple of days of a few sessions? You can't do that with people raising their hands and speaking one at a time, or we'd be here for 10,000 years. Uh, but we could do it in ways where we can start to collapse ideas or use um, collaborative filters or to use kind of rounds and voting mechanisms and clustering techniques. And there's a lot of ways you could do it. These DAOs are providing a lot of interesting ways to collapse a lot of ways to do idea generation, selection and prioritization, you know, finding the ideas, coming to decisions, and then even some of the more of the mechanisms of funding and things like that. We can, like, these are good things to be asking, and there are ways, there's got to be ways to do this. There's going to be various ways to do it that'll be appropriate for different environments, for public sector self-governance, for corporate self-governance, for unions, for political parties, for, you know, you name it, um, for federations of universities, for, for indigenous peoples, uh, you know, for neighborhoods. Um, and so uh, I, I sincerely hope that we can use this time together and the special release to start to identify, sort of like to Nathan's point in that article, what would some of the components be? What would be some of the core capabilities that we would want to orchestrate and architect together to form different, to compose different systems of governance? Uh, what are those? What are those questions? What are those capabilities? What are those functions? Where do you draw the lines and how do they connect together? Those are, that's my, my, my big question. And we, we care about this here um, and MIT be, partly because <clears throat> this is coming out of the Media Lab, which is um, a place that does try to do cross-disciplinary or tr you know almost anti-disciplinary work and uh, law and economics and technology and sociology and all of these things are um, are implicated with governance. You know, governance is not one thing. Arguably, it's the pointy end of of the spear for everything. I mean, for for like a lot of things. Cor we talked about corporations, Brian did, and other things. And we're at time. And so uh, and so so this is part of our um, part of the um, portfolio of things in the media lab where we bring people together from different disciplines, set a hard challenge and try to rapid prototype and and uh, and rapid ideation for potential solutions. The last thing I'll say is, well, Brian said this may be the beginning of, of an ongoing conversation it, it, in the form of our publication. Of course, we punctuate that when we actually publish things. Uh, it's not we're not going to talk forever. So do um, submit your ideas on the form on law.mit.edu forward slash composable governance we'll evaluate them and we will publish something. We may continue to publish after that, but, the, but we are aiming in 2022 to wrap up package and like birth um, a, a, a standalone special release. Join us for that. And now, dessert. <laughs> and so one of the bigger thinkers um, who I've ever met uh, in the area that I would say broadly uh, is uh, uh, sort of um, meta governance. Um, and uh, engineering is Sargam. And so, thank you very much for taking time out of your day, Z, to join us. And, and won't you please share some of your ideas on composable governance? Yeah, I will do so. Um, I think it's interesting. We've talked a lot about automation and autonomy because I'm like an automation engineer, right? I studied in a robotics lab and I'm epistemic trespassing on governance and law hardcore here. So feel free to check me there. But the first thing I want to point out is that, you know, this concept of, of code as law is prevalent in the um, sort of certainly in, in the Web3 space, but I think it's a really important observation that sort of code structures the field of action for others or governs. But interestingly, in the sort of estimation decision making kind of engineering field, we call our algorithms policies. And I've been sort of pushing this um, semantic shift from code as law to algorithms as policy because it actually evokes a different mental model for the hearer. And I think it's more alignment aligned with reality. Um, so um, in practice, I um, 
frequently have to disambiguate what I mean when I say autonomy, especially because the right half of this tree is what I'm used to from uh, estimation decisions or sort of robotics world. You know, we as designers sort of give these systems goals, optimization objectives. Essentially, we imbue them with their purpose and they have a degree of tactical autonomy. So you might argue that we give we have strategic autonomy or some goal setting power, even as engineers who design systems that actually imbue um, uh, a degree of autonomy in the um, in the actors to pursue those goals. And that stays in contrast to, you know, the political notion of autonomy, which is generally um, in tension between sort of the individuals making decisions for themselves versus joining into sort of collectives that have their own collective autonomy or the ability to accomplish things maybe that the individuals wouldn't be able to at the cost of sort of constraining themselves some. And so with this sort of juxtaposition of the more legal or governance view of autonomy and this more like technical, a more functional view of autonomy, I've been working for actually some years on frameworks for um, like sort of designing automations that respect the sort of input information from humans and that way in which the human decision making and machine decision making um, or algorithms might actually be coherent. So this is a brief out overview of a, a working paper I'm writing with Shamshit Shorish and have been actually for years. Um, the main points here is that we're taking the concepts from dynamical systems that are used for automation in an engineering setting and trying to apply them in a sufficiently abstract way that we get some of their powers for um, problems above and beyond sort of physical systems. And a big part of that has been foregoing a degree of predictability around what people will do and focus on what can be done and doing what we call reachability analysis. And uh, Jamshid is a contract theorist, a co computational economist, and some of our example explorations have included things like insurance contracts and other topics. I'm not sure if that's the example that will a fifth appear in the paper that we're working on right now. We're like kind of thinking we're going to break out examples from foundations and then do something later on a range of examples. But since the theme today is composable governance, I kind of want to point out quickly what composability looks like in this world. So this is a kind of canonical like automation problem. You have a plant and a sensor and you're able to sort of this plant is the way the system works. Sensor is how you measure it. But that thing can then be augmented naturally to something like this which includes some sort of computation of an error or a gap from a desired outcome and a decision-making actor like a controller. This kind of composability of the logical blocks is the benchmark for the engineering sort of automation world. And it doesn't necessarily mean that there's no information about the outside world. And so my um, main point today is that um, I believe it's actually really important to A, distinguish what we mean about sort of how we come to decisions and set goals versus how we design systems that pursue or attempt to fulfill those goals. And then ultimately um, leaving the power in the humans to make decisions about whether or not the system that they are participating in is actually achieving, achieving its goals or whether um, the measurements that we're currently using of those goals are still in line with um, our desired outcomes. And that sort of brings us back around to algorithms as policy, because what I showed you is actually what we would call a control policy. And a control policy pursues a goal, and it can be evaluated against that goal and changed if and when it's necessary. So you know, regardless of whether we're talking about algorithms implemented by governments that represent the policies that they passed in a legislative branch, whether we're talking about the algorithmic policies for, let's say, uh, moderating content in a Web2 platform, or whether we're talking about something like a crypto economic policy in Web3. In all of these cases, we're actually talking about algorithmic policies, and very much they are composed. That's the end of my little talk. <laughs> Thank you so much. Before we go on to Wasim, could you go back, could you slide share again, please, and go back to the second to last slide? And for- There's the lucid chart, yeah, lucid chart. For the, yeah, uh, the lucid chart, and specifically the di the engineering diagram where you showed, yeah, the one just before, yeah, uh, after oh, that, yeah, uh, after that, uh, this one. Um, could you just say a couple of words for those 
people that may not be familiar even with the difference between parameter space and state space and just you know how the arrows show a state change and what a parameter is just sure. so people can interpret yeah. this. Yeah, so sorry, this was meant more as a visual aid, but so this is a like pretty canonical um, dy dynamical system. It's actually a, a describing a, a linear time invariant canonical form control system. And the difference between the parameters and the states here are that um, the states sort of represent the things that are flowing. So this is a, you know, a thing that can act, it's doing. Like if you were looking at a data feed generated by this, it would look like the states, like points in the state space x, u, y, and e, and you would see a sequence of x's and u's and y's and e's over time as it evolved, but the parameter space, these are the descriptions of, let's say, the physical characteristics if this is a physical system, and they're going to be mostly constant, or in practice, they're constant in this representation unless you create a higher level model that, say, updates them. Now, there are engineering cases where you have another higher level system that's job is to actually estimate these values, because in a lot of engineered systems, we don't have the degree of certainty that most people think. We have a, an abstract representation of the system, um, but we're constantly using data to update our best estimate of the current description of that system. So. Um, there's a whole you know, field that sort of is predicated on this kind of construction, and it's generally the field that's used for, for automated uh, decision making. So I thought here, it was here. relevant. It is relevant. And so just to, and just to bring it home a little bit, one, one could imagine um, if one was a grad student suffering in my class in 97, looking at like Robert's rules, for example, uh, a rule for parliamentary debate and, and identifying parameters uh, that would go into uh, discussions uh, or that would be inputs and state changes like from a proposal to an amendment to uh, to you know something being an adopted or rejected for example I mean it depends what level of abstraction we're looking like in, arguably you could go super micro and one of those parameters has its own you could you could assign states to it and you know uh, but 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 an engineering diagram, is precious and being able to understand something from genuine engineers and begin to bring that into legal practice and into um, product design and um, and into into a broader civic conversation even about self governance and governance systems I think is uh, is just so very very valuable so thank you for taking a moment to use that as a visual aid but also to give us like a little bit of a flavor of some of what goes into an engineering diagram because I do think that there's some amount of fluency everybody can have about um, about the processes and systems that we live within. Um, and ultimately, you know, self-governance is going to be a matter of engineering to the extent that we live in cyberspace. Uh, so, okie dokie, enough of that. And there I am talking again. Uh, and so now we have in the hot seat, Wasim, the technology editor of the MIT Computational Law Report. Hey everybody, I won't take too long um, because I think it'd be nice for us to have a little bit of time to, to discuss and chat uh, after we've uh, heard from everybody. Uh, it's been a really nice session, so thanks for thanks for coming. And um, I just while we've been talking, I didn't have any planned remarks, but I was just thinking, had the phrase in my mind going around, live by composability, die by composability. So I wonder if like we can um, find some cautionary tales, like you know, and I'm pr principally a specialist in the kind of blockchain milieu. And I think at the very least, depending on, regardless of what your opinion about blockchains is, at the very least, we know that we can build toy models with them, like, and we can uh, exemplify various economic models or governance models or whatever else uh, from that. Um, and so, yeah, I wonder if we could think about some of those, because there have been quite a few interesting uh, shenanigans, like things happening in the last few weeks, uh, what with the economic realities of these networks changing quite suddenly. And so I was just reading uh, a Twitter post by the not pseudonymous researcher Hasu earlier, um, where they're making some proposals for um, MakerDAO governance. And in there, they were talking about this concept of a governance supply chain, which I think is not that far away from what both Zagam and Dazza were just talking about. And in there, they broke them down, uh, broke this governance supply chain into four stages. Uh, the first one is vision, then strategy, then tactics, and then implementation. So I think it's kind of a general kind of a schema of how to think of like the pipeline of uh, of governance. You know, if we take governance to be how we decide about the stuff that we do. Um, I also think it's interesting to think about 
Um, scale, yeah, and also like as you're talking about outcome evaluation, yeah, so that we close that loop rather than having it just as a flow. Um, a governance scale, and I think, you know, in terms of the, we talked also about kind of, uh, you know, what kind of um, uh, systems or communities are we governing? And we heard from Catalba, which is actually a really interesting example, because I think that's a fairly kind of, let's say, like meso scale governance system. It's not a small collective, it's not a nation state, it's somewhere in the, in the middle. I think that's that's very interesting. Um, and so, yeah, so, so for me, I can see on this kind of axis of scalability, or if you've got like, you know, your Dunbar scale or something, you've got like the individual, then you've got like small groups, you might call those cliques, squads, you've heard people call them, then you might scale up to communities, and then you might scale up to this notion of a, a public, you know, the, the people at large. And so I also think that it's, in, it's important for us to think about uh, what we're governing and what's, what scale the system is meant to govern. And that will inform like how we design and apply the, the most appropriate um, tools. And so yeah, just to, to loop back to this idea I had at the start of um, the kind of live by, compo live by composability and die by composability. Uh, so I was thinking about this concept of interdependency, which has been around for a long time, but it's been kind of uh, growing in its kind of mimetic gravitas, particularly in the, in the Web3 space. And uh, interdependency sounds like a, it's the sort of thing that sounds great, and I think that when the sun is shining, the idea of interdependency is, is, is great. You're kind of uh, building uh, resilient systems uh, one on top of each other. But what about when the, um, the winter comes? You know, it seems that we're in some kind of you know, winter now, at least in the, uh, the world of, of blockchains. Um, do, does this kind of interdependency then start to lead to uh, fragilities, like more fragilities than you would have in a less composed or a less composable uh, system? And um, you know, I think we may, have, you know, most of us have probably noticed that the um, the change in sentiment in the crypto markets was triggered by a few quite large catastrophic events, and some of those events were made worse uh, because of the governance rights attached to certain tokens. I'm thinking about uh, Terra and Luna here, where um, you know, at one point in that uh, uh, the, the process of that project um, unwinding uh, was that uh, there was a huge mint of token supply to avoid a potential uh, governance attack. There was a worry that a, a whale or a malicious actor could uh, pick up a whole bunch of tokens at a very low price and then execute, um, you know, a basic takeover, political takeover of, of the network. And usually these things kind of end with the treasury being reassigned to the entity that did the attack and then them cashing out. A uh, fortress was another example of, of that kind of thing um, happening. Um, so yeah, I just wanted us to bear in mind this idea that, um, you know, composability is uh, can, just like many things in, in technology and, and you know, organizational um, uh, philosophy. It can be a blessing and a curse depending on the uh, depending on the context. And the last thing I want to say is like the I, the, the concepts that we that we've developed through uh, ten th to 12, 13 years of, of blockchain thinking um, can be applied outside the blockchain uh, domain. So we can use some of these uh, ideas and notions, templates. And, uh, you know, so we can try to leverage what we think of as the affordances, idiosyncrasies of these systems, uh, whilst perhaps sidestepping some of the limitations or the constraints. Um, and so this is a, an interesting kind of web two meets web three, I guess, uh, interface. And there's an interesting example, which I'll just um, point to now, which is called the Black Swan DAO. And this is a kind of arts focused project, which is using the logics of, of blockchain. So this kind of like discretized time, like block time uh, logic. Uh, looking at uh, using uh, things like quadratic voting, so different kinds of voting mechanisms, uh, but they're doing that on Web2 technological substrates, so they're not using the blockchain uh, per se. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I will yield, and hopefully we've got a bit of time to um, throw it open for discussion on the floor. Yeah. Outstanding. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was cool. That really got me thinking. Um, so we'll take this moment to... Um, Thank everybody that has provided a flash talk for this inaugural um, initial, I guess I should say. Yeah. I don't want to suggest it'll be annual. <laughs> um, this, this, um, th this initial um, idea forum on composable governance. And, um, and again, encourage you, everybody to uh, learn more and to submit your own ideas uh, for, the, for the upcoming special release at law.mit.edu forward slash composable governance.
Okay, and now so that gives me an opportunity to have an edit point where I can sort of wrap that up and publish it. And now it's fun time where we get to talk to each other. If it's okay with everybody, I'll keep recording just in case somebody like drops a gem out there that, that we'll all regret not being able to replay in you know forever on infinite loop. Also, I want to I want to um, welcome um, Susanna um, who has uh, was able to join us uh, part way through. And who I, I hope will be able to uh, provide a flash talk at a, at a future one of these fora. Uh, uh, she and I met when, when you were at Consensus, and you've gone on to do some really interesting things um, in the, um, I guess, in the space, let me just say. So if you'd like to introduce yourself, uh, please do. And then uh, the floor is open for anyone that would like to uh, make any remarks or ask any of the other speakers uh, any questions or any other comments. Oh, and you're on um, mute, Susanna. Oh. So. <laughs> Thank you, Saza. It's good to be here. I'm sorry I'm, I was not able to join for the Flash Talks. Ironically, I'm here at the Austin Convention Center where we're going to be holding um, the independent convention um, gathering uh, in October for the next upcoming election here in the United States. And we're sitting in prayer with indigenous peoples here. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting, the, the parallel between this discussion with these evolved forms of governance um, and structures that we can plug people into. Um, so I'm really curious to hear what came through here in this, during this workshop. And yeah, a little bit about myself. I've, worked across many different sectors. After consensus, I started a nonprofit called Peace Accelerators um, and really activated local communities to co-create solutions to solve our local and global challenges. Um, I've worked in um, finance and philanthropy and now currently creating a think tank called the Institute of Natural Law and Governance. And um, with the communities that we are, are touching, we'll be co-creating a new economic framework called the Rights of Nature Economic Framework. And I'm curious about how we can utilize um, Web3 and smart contracts to enable natural ecosystems to be participants in our economy and um, in, our, in, in our governance processes. So that's my current focus right now. Um, also working on an NFT docu series called Never Forget This. And um, building out a fund called the Regeneration Fund, um, but really guided by original principles that the Indigenous peoples have been practicing for um, centuries. And <laughs> so I, um, we're, we're learning from these Indigenous peoples to codify those principles into uh, these frameworks. And uh, yeah, excited to figure out how we can all collaborate you're here. Th thank you so much. Yeah, and, and she only scratched the surface. She does a lot, a lot more than that. Um, and I encourage you, Susanna, to connect with, or could, could one of the folks from Catawba maybe put a link again into your project again here, because um, she may not have access to the prior chat. But you, you should check out these uh, folks from Catawba who, who I'm, I'm meeting now only live for the first time, but they're doing really interesting stuff uh, with um, a Native American tribe. Um, and and a new um, kind of economic autonomous zone uh, focused on possibly DAOs and some other things that are compatible with what you're interested in. I encourage you, Susanna, to if you if you don't mind to also um, answer the questions that they published in a in a request for responses to a notice of proposed rulemaking. You can find at the link that they provided. Okay, so with that done, um, now that everyone knows each other at our cocktail party, um, discuss. <laughs> I'm gonna go on mute so I'm not the only one talking. Nathan, do you wanna jump on the do you wanna jump on the mic and um, ask you another question? Oh, I didn't really I didn't really have a question uh so much as just uh, saying that I was curious about the natural learning more about the natural rights framework. I've been I posted uh in the chat there an essay I've been I uh, just published on um, human rights, encoding human rights in blockchains, and and you know I, th I think it's relevant to this discussion just in the sense that it's it's an attempt to to kind of wedge open the question of what what kinds of policies are we not putting in protocols, 
um, that we could be and perhaps should be, um, what, what kinds of rights are protocols already recognizing, what kinds of rights should we be expecting that they recognize, particularly when we start to imagine the kinds of abuses they could introduce. Super pertinent to the work I'm doing. Thank you for sharing, Nathan. I'll drop my, my email in the chat and if anyone wants to reach out, I'd love to schedule a call. Great, thank you. Is there a really, I, I do have a question, I guess, since there's a little bit of a low. Um, is there a relation, what is the relationship between the work, um, Natalie, that you had done with seasteading um, and and that take on jurisdictions that are not, you know, tied to traditional, you know, like nation states, and and what what's happening now with uh, Catawba? Yeah, so they are similar and different, similar in the sense that they are both approaches to regulations that focus on the local aspect, but they are different in their approach. One is more alternative type of governance, seasteading, versus special economic zones are embedded within a nested structure of governance. Uh, from I'm thinking about scale, global, well, I can no longer talk about nations uh, being at the center, but global, nations, cities, and special economic zones uh, at the same level. So, the yeah and they both have different approaches to to how they see dairy dairy too and but definitely zones um there's already 5400 of them across the world different types of zones um so one is more idealistic and versus zones is actually something that already exists and we are very familiar with them you have things like Dubai, Shenzhen, and free trade zones all across the world. So, yeah. Uh, sorry, I think we're experiencing, uh, oh, enlightenment again. Uh, <laughs> we're off here for a moment. Um, and, and then, um, and Joseph, I, I saw just looking at your LinkedIn that there was a theme that I think you refer to as competitive governance. Could you maybe just say a few words about what that phrase means? Yeah, I mean, we also prefer the term innovative governance, but the point being is, for one, trying to provide the best service for uh, uh, citizens or residents or people that you're providing governmental services to, rather than treat them as, you know, just, you know, someone that, um, that you're not accountable to. And oftentimes that means taking some principles common in startups and, and, and nimble organizations and applying it to the principles of governance. And when you're working with special economic zones like ourselves, um, that's innately the case. Because if you don't provide a better gov governing services in let's say Delaware or Wyoming, they'll simply say, well, I'd rather just register a company in Delaware they provide better service. But if we can provide better technology for them to have a more seamless experience, provide better regulations that are more accommodating to um, in the market, then we'll be able to have larger market share than if we just simply treated it um, as a given, like many other governments do. Um, so I, I kind of want to jump in. We were talking about um, sort of the various scales of, of governance. And one thing that I, I've observed, and people can jump in if they, they've observed differently, but historically, we think of, of governance as being sort of like scale, like, you know, sort of local, and then you've got regional, and you might have a national uh, stage, or then ultimately some sort of, you know, diplomatic protocols that govern a, a global stage. But, you know, in the modern era, um, the the networks are not quite so clean, nice DAGs, right? We have, even if you're just incorporating a, in a state somewhere like Delaware, because you like the, um, uh, the particular affordances of that state's incorporation laws, um, we're already starting to see lots of like cross wiring. And I, and I think that the um, technological um, implementations of various, um, let's say policy regimes are increasing the degree to which these 
uh, graphs have a vastly different topology um, than they might have historically had. Again, this is a governance topology where you know jurisdictions have direct interactions through, let's say, shared constituents, variety of other ways that they might have interactions within a graph. Um, and I make this observation because having worked on estimation decision control systems embedded in networks, one of the most important findings is actually that the graph topology matters a lot. So even the same sets of processes um, can be create different emergent behaviors on significantly different graph topologies. I love this point. And I'm curious, riffing off what Natalie was saying too, like how, just thinking through how people will self-organize using this kind of decentralized technology across borders as we currently know it to uh, collectively manage resources is something that I'm also exploring to create you know more more of the of the commons um, so yeah curious have, are you are you focused on that work right now Z and Natalie in terms of like see, exploring how those new borders will look like. I don't, I don't know if borders is the right word for it, but I imagine people self-organized across bioregions in the future. Well, uh, so Natalie, do you mind if I take this? Sure. Yeah, uh, so with, with the project, um, one of the things that, you know, we're, we're decentralization maximalists. We do, at least we, we, we believe in a, a variety of the, of the topology versus, you know, the fairly centralized standard that we have currently. Um, but uh, we obviously that needs to be done responsibly and with the understanding that the topology is, for better or worse, dependent on jurisdiction and land. Um, so there needs to be a middle point, a bridge to get to the point where you have true variation in governance. Um, you can't simply just create an online protocol. I mean, to a certain extent, you can. Uh, Bitcoin is a you know, very good example of you can make real governance changes without having to directly interface with a with a, with a jurisdiction all the time, but still ultimately the natural persons that own Bitcoin and the companies that interact with Bitcoin are still dependent on jurisdiction. So if you have a friendly jurisdiction that's kind of a middle point between the digital world and, and the world of the Westphalian type system, then you can provide an acceleration of the, that variation of governance that I think a lot of people here would like to see. And my answer is really that I, I'm working much more on, on the tech side of um, the design of mechanisms and sort of institutional patterns, but I am sort of very much seconding the appeal to uh, institutional biodiversity. Um, that's sort of a, a main, uh, I guess, finding uh, of the extrapolating from my field onto governance as I'm epistemic trespassing um, from engineering uh, is that actually I strongly believe that these health, these systems are healthy and resilient if and only if they have a kind of um, sort of cultural and institutional biodiversity. Yeah, you, you touch on a great point and it reminds me of what brought me to think about different types of governance systems, ones that were optimized for the type of social interactions, economic interactions that take place in human communities, and is nature's topologies. Nature has billions of years in expertise in designing self-organized, distributed, decentralized systems. And why not take an example from, from, from the best? Yeah. Yeah, there's a there's a really good book by uh, I forget her name uh, Julia Watson called uh, Low Tech, um, but Tech is spelled T E K and stands for Traditional Ecological Knowledge, and it's nice. a book. It's literally a book about building um, things with nature, and it's kind of like an interesting foundation to start from because I think if we begin with a uh, with a uh, if we begin from a place where we're taking into account nature and taking into account all of these different um, systems that we are operating in then we can sort of start mapping out that taxonomy that ontology into something that looks like a project that um, came out of a thing that I know Nathan has worked on 
uh, I don't remember the name of it, community governance something. Um, but then if, if we wanna play around with, you know, does this work, how does this work? You can get to something like this um, cool uh, product that I've worked with a little bit recently called uh, Machinations where you can literally design how the mechanisms work and then you can run simulations to see, are they achieving the goals that we want? Where are their vulnerabilities? And have a new sort of tooling available to you to, to visually see you know, to what extent um, are we achieving the goals that we've set out or what are we missing or what are we not thinking about? What externalities are out there that uh, might uh, be important to accommodate in future types of governance structures. So I, I think this is on containers. Uh, yeah, they also have a whole web three thing with automated market makers. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I've been using it in that context, like how do you, how could you create an automated market maker that is biased towards outcomes that benefit a particular system? Um, and that project is actually working with some computational neuroscience people to do uh, free energy minimization with, based on a certain number of parameters in order to, uh, you know, say, hey, we've got all this data about um, land quality and we've got all this data about traffic and we've got all this data about the amount of money generated by toll booths. Um, what can the regulation of traffic tell us about how all of these things are fitting in together. And so I think that piece is something that's um, pretty interesting, but you could you could apply it to any number of systems that have sufficient number, sufficient amount of data that can be uh, can be ingested and composed in that kind of way that we've been talking about. And so I think this is this this kind of evolution of uh, of governance as you begin to think about it from uh, computational perspective, like you were saying, with the um, the OpenGov project, you know that kind of evolution is is I think really exciting and really um, really promising. And so I uh, yeah I don't know that's that was the end of my thought. <laughs> that is so cool. Okay, I'm going to talk again now. Um, so what, what, something that that just called to mind when you started talking about tolls. Yeah. Uh, it reminded me of my uh, when I started my career career career, like for work, um, with all due respect as opposed to research. Um, I was a lawyer in a government and, um, and we would do a lot of infrastructure and I got pulled into a lot of the infrastructure work. There's this interesting model that's sort of similar to the uh, flow that uh, Natalie and Joseph were starting to tease out on these um, sort of uh, less traditional, um, but, but um, but, um, but still um, uh, well, pretty well-defined um, 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 context of governance. And it's the quasi-public entity or different ways to structure public-private partnerships for like a, um, a big infrastructure thing, like a port authority or, a, um, you know, or like a big bridge or uh, even at certain arenas and other kind of big, big things um, where it's not exactly a jurisdiction, but it's, if you blur your eyes, it's not that different, where it's got um, kind of like funding that goes, you know, for you know, 20, 30 years operating budget. It's got, you know, its own ability to sort of make rules that transcend, um, you know, the multiple jurisdictions usually that it's within. Um, it's got governance for sure. It's got stakeholders, decision making, you know, a whole bunch of interesting stuff. And usually there's some statutes around them, but when all's said and done um, and other stuff. So I, want, I just wonder if there isn't another um, canvas to paint on for composable governance that would be uh, some kind of quasi public big capital budget infrastructure project of the of the future, the stuff that's kind of where, where people are starting to um, propose it now, but it hasn't come together yet. So I'll just throw that out there. And we're, we're at time. time. Um, so, um, you know, we're not done because we've said everything. Um, we're only done because um, we've reached time. And, uh, and, and I, I hope that this idea forum, this initial one, has served its purpose, which is to begin. 
um, and to start to put some ideas out that um, that we can learn from each other on and that we can continue to pull uh, these threads and start to weave together uh, the fabric of what composable governance could be. Um, and so I want to thank everybody for showing up today and uh, and for sharing what you did. And, and we hope that you'll stay with us and that you will submit some of these thoughts in the form of a contribution that we can publish uh, in our special release on composable governance. So until then, thanks again, and we'll see you at the next IDEA Forum. Thank you so much thank you for inviting us. Yes. Yeah, thank you for organizing, Daza. Lovely to meet you all. Lovely to meet yeah. you. Thank you, Daza. Thank you, everyone.